Knowing that you're going to every ground in, in the world, almost thinking you've got a good chance of winning here, is a bit lucky, really, you know, because most teams are not going to have that much power almost going into it wherever they go. This is an amazing team. They've been indisputably the best team in the country for 18 months. Chasing down City, being hungry to get City, is what our squad is, is put together to do, isn't it? Weirdly, Liverpool owe City a debt, and it's taken the arrival of arguably the best team that's ever been in the Premier League. Liverpool to go, right, we're going to beat you. What's it like being in Anfield on a European night this like that? This is my, my first one, this. Yeah, all oh, right. So you look, how much are you looking forward to it then? I can't wait. I'm shaking with excitement, nerves. What means more to Liverpool fans at this moment in time, the Premier League or the Champions League? Definitely the Premier League, yep. The Champions League's a bonus. For 30 years, it's just, it's definitely the league, and we've been waiting for it for that long, and we've had these upsets and all that. They haven't fluked it, it's not just been a mad run. They are the best, and not just the best, they could be the best of the best. Got your Champions merchandise, that's going to be flying off the shelves, are you? Hopefully, yeah, <laughs> yeah, the designs are there. We put a few up the other night, obviously, we didn't want to tempt fate and put them out. The city will go absolutely berserk, won't it? It'll be absolutely crazy. I'm all for for the parade as well, because that, that'll be nuts, I can't wait. Well, here we are. I should be preparing for the Merseyside derby on a night when Liverpool could have been crowned Premier League champions, but unfortunately that's not going to happen. We are in the midst of a global crisis with the coronavirus outbreak. It's not a football problem, it's a, it's a society problem, what we, all, what we all have in common. We've had a few players that have shown symptoms and, and signs. Fasher up to a arena, ain't no fans <laughs> I ain't On Friday, the Premier League, the Football League and the Women's Super League were all suspended formally until at least the 3rd of April. In terms of social interaction, take a step back. The thing is, I have nothing to say about the coronavirus. You know, it's something that I have no decision, no influence on. All over the world, we're seeing the devastating impact of this invisible killer. I think all of us, we are trying to react to the situation that are coming on a daily basis. I think they are doing in the worldwide as much as possible, you know, to eradicate it. From this evening, I must give the British people a very simple instruction. You must stay at home. Probably the biggest disruption to the global sport and calendar since the Second World War, and at the moment, no sign as to how long it will go on for. It's Tuesday, March the 24th, and the UK is in lockdown. Last night, Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced stricter measures on social distancing aimed at combating the rise of the coronavirus. This park that I'm in near my home in Liverpool, it would usually be heaven. It'd usually be full of kids playing out, playing football, riding bikes, dog walkers, joggers, all those kind of people. Instead, it's deserted. Liverpool fans had hoped for a momentous celebration to celebrate their first league title in 30 years, but those plans have been put on hold. But for how long? One man who knows all about Liverpool's long way for a league title is Stephen Warnock. Born on the outskirts of the city and a boyhood red, Warnock made 67 appearances for the Reds between 2004 and 2007. It would be a hard situation anyway because they've been denied, obviously, being the chance to play and they've been worried about health and loved ones and that kind of thing. But what will that do to, to the mindset of the players? Because we hear a lot about their mentality and how strong they are, but this would be a huge test for, for those players, wouldn't it? Yeah, this is a completely different test, isn't it? Um, how do you deal with this? I'm not, I'm not so sure how you would because, again, it's out of your hands. Um at least when you're playing in, in the league and you've got to win them two games or you've got four games to win, it's in your hands. This is completely out of their hands. It's something that they can't control. They can't go into training and try and train harder and make sure that they prepare better because at the end of the day, someone can pull the plug on the whole lot and, and change the, uh, the situation. Again, I think the mindset of these players or the Liverpool players in general this season has been so positive is that they have to just keep believing that the season will restart and that they have to be ready for that first game as soon as it comes up. 
a different experience, obviously, but you, you've had serious injuries early in your career. You had a couple of broken legs and you obviously, you have to spend a lot of time away from your normal, your normal football and routine of training and playing and traveling to matches and all that kind of thing. How hard a challenge is that mentally? Not necessarily the injury itself, but the, the denial of your routine, if you like, or the or the getting into a sort of a, a more bleak routine where you can't do the things that you enjoy doing most. most. Yeah, I I struggled a lot mentally. I, I really did. Um, probably started drinking a little bit when I shouldn't have as well because you you just want to get away from it all because you can't do what you you want to do. Um, I think I probably went went into depression for a, probably a few months because of the way it was. But then you get the right people around you, you, you change your mentality, you look forward and you try and think of the positives uh, behind it all. But I think the biggest thing is try and put yourself in a routine um, yeah. try and set yourself a goal every day of something to do and something to, to reach that goal, wake up the next day, set a new goal. Um, but it's about the people around you, um, the, the, the positive impact that they try and have on your your life, your outcome at the end of, of where you want to get to and whether they can contribute to that as well. So for me, it was always about um, yeah, setting goals and, and make sure and I try to achieve them. The coronavirus pandemic has hit every walk of life in ways that would have been unimaginable just a few weeks ago. To find out how Liverpool fans are processing the escalation of the lockdown, I spoke to Anfield season ticket holder and lead singer of The Farm, Peter Hooten. What have you made of the, the debate over football? I mean, and, and specifically when it'll resume and, and how it'll resume. I've tried to stay out of the football debate. Even two or three weeks ago, we were still thinking, and we were doing podcasts on it, saying, well, even if we play Everton behind closed doors and then pass, you know, because we were even thinking uh, on the Thursday after the Madrid game, so that was the Thursday just before the um, the Premier League pulled the plug on the Friday, we were still thinking, well, they might play behind closed doors, you know, you never know. Because there was an attitude of complacency. The last time Liverpool played a competitive game was Wednesday the 11th of March. It was the Champions League last 16 second leg against Atletico Madrid. That night, across Europe, as fears grew, many games were played behind closed doors. And just two days after it, the Premier League went into lockdown. Knowing what we know now and the way that the, the situation's developed, it seems it seems crazy almost that that went ahead and that obviously 54,000 fans were there, 3,000 travelled over from Spain. Were you surprised at the time or is that something that's it's a benefit of hindsight really that we're able to say that? No, I think it's a benefit of hindsight. I think if, um, I think obviously you were at the game, I was at the game and one of the first things I heard when I got to the ground was that the tunnel had been shut off. There was no press allowed down there, no media or anything. Um, it was very sort of protect the players at all costs and make sure that no one goes in, in and around the area. But I think if if we're all being completely honest, I think we were all a little bit, a little bit blasé about it. I don't think we realised the severity of the actual disease and how quick or the virus and how quick it can spread. Um, how contagious it can be and how closely uh, we were all sat in that media room that night. Now, anyone could have had it in that media room and we wouldn't have had a clue. I feel guilty about it because I, I reported on that game like it was a normal game and, you know, we had the yeah. feelings about it. When you look back on it, I mean, can you believe that game took place? Not really, no, not looking back on it. And I didn't particularly want to go. I didn't follow me usual routine. I didn't go to the pub before and I didn't go to the pub afterwards. I just thought, I'm not putting myself at risk. It's hard to qualify the, the idea of being disappointed, obviously, from a Liverpool perspective or, a, or a, just a social perspective. But it's a massive yeah. change, isn't it? And do you think that's sort of where it's really hit home to people that their, their everyday life has changed? That... I think it's the, it's the simple things in life that, you, you know, which you deny to you, which really become... You know, you realise how I, I, I put on Twitter last week, I'll never ever moan about there being too much football on the telly ever again. I know it's a cliche thing, the football family and all that, but I think it's a community, you know, it's a communal thing. Uh, and it's what Shankly used to talk about all the time, you know. Uh, you keep society in order because you have football. It's been a generation since Liverpool were able to say they were league champions. In the intervening 30 years, the Premier League arrived and English football's culture changed dramatically. 
Manchester United were the dominant force of the 1990s, but since the turn of the century, their supremacy has been challenged by the likes of Chelsea, Manchester City, and on one famous occasion, Leicester City. Before the lockdown, I met up with Ian Doyle of the Liverpool Echo, the Anfield Raps, Neil Atkinson, and Jan Mulby, the former Reds midfielder. What's it like to, to, to win a league title and to, to, to get your hands on that trophy, to get your hands on that medal, and then have Ronnie Moran tell you to, <laughs> to, tell you to throw it away? But what, what's it like to be at Anfield, to lift that, that, that trophy and, and, and experience that rush? The 86 one was, was great because it was the break of, 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 of a great team at the start of the 80s, isn't it? And then 88 with all the changes, which was very unlike Liverpool, wasn't it? I think people went into that season thinking, well, this can go either way. There's less memories of 90, isn't it, for some reason? No, I, so we, we, before we started, we had a chat, and Ian went to, I mean, you probably can't remember 90. And I said, I can't, but I can remember 88. I can remember yeah, going yeah. to matches. Yeah. I was only seven years old, but I can remember going to matches 87, 88. Yeah. My first game, Jan scores a penalty, by the way. Uh, Gary Gillespie takes the other one off you for his hat trick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Very generous. Yeah, very Could generous. Game, you? <laughs> but, but I remember I remember supporting Liverpool 85, yeah. 86 as a five year old. I remember watching the final, and maybe it's a bit of a false memory. I remember 87, 88. I remember going to games. I can't remember 89, 90. Just, just going back to the last time Liverpool won the league, do you, do you have any memories of, of, of that 1990? Yeah, I, I, I do remember it. Um, I remember I was only young, but I understood what it meant. Um, I loved me football. So I, I, you just knew how powerful Liverpool were at the time. Yeah. But just like you say, you expected within the next couple of years to win another title. To have that, that weight for so long has, has been very tough. When you've had success, how hard is it to plan for the future because you've got loyalty to the players? How hard is it to get those decisions right and to sort of to, to get the balance between keeping it refreshed and keeping it moving forward but also paying tribute to legends? Yeah, and it, it had been an incredible strength of Liverpool, hasn't it? You know, getting those decisions absolutely right and moving players on five minutes before their time was up. Uh, and then we get to 1990 or 1991 when Sooners came in. And I don't think there was anything wrong with Sooners looking and thinking, if you keep this fire burning, I need to do something. And he, he went about doing that in a manner that he will look back on today and go, I probably got that wrong. Yeah. And the biggest thing wasn't necessarily the players he let go. It was the players that he brought from one day to another down in Melbourne to training ground. And we'd, we did very sim simple training. We, did, we played five a side every day. But he was always played to a level. Yeah. You know, and then all of a sudden, from one day to another, we go, what, what, what is the this? levels drop? Yeah. No, but there's no way we can play the way we want to play on a Saturday if 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 this is what we produce in, in in the midweek. And so everything changed. Do you think it gets harder the longer that 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 monkey hangs over? Yes and no. Uh, the the first thing you have to do is is realise where you're at. And, and and I think in many ways Liverpool realised that with the appointment of Gerard Hulier. That was a time when they thought, okay, we might have to do something different. Roy had been in, and Roy was a great. Appointment. I, I never thought that team in the mid '90s were going to win the title. You know, I think at that round that time we were probably more inclined to think that if anyone else apart from Manchester United, it's going to be Newcastle, isn't it? I think the quicker you realise you've got problems, the, the, the better chance you have of putting it right. And then I think it was a real challenge for the likes of Steven Gerrard and Jamie Carragher when they came into the team and sort of flying the flag for, for, for local people. You know. I spoke to Jan Mulby for this this documentary that we're doing, and he said that he always felt that the local players and the academy players that came through, he always felt that they carried almost more of a burden because of the the league title, the weight, and you know Stephen Gerrard and Jamie Carragher obviously being the, the biggest examples. Did you ever feel that sort of that extra sort of motivation or desire? Uh, well, for me, I, I was desperate to win the league and or desperate to to push as close as you could. You 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 grow up dreaming of that. I think what Stevie and Jamie did was they they learned to deal with the pressure of playing for a club like Liverpool better than I ever did. I think that's one of the things why I never succeeded at Liverpool is because I grew up as a fan. Uh, I grew up with my family and friends supporting Liverpool, so I almost felt that burden of just playing for the club. Now, trying to deliver a title as well on top of that was, was frightening. I, th I think sometimes you don't realise how big a club it is. Um, when you come into it, if you haven't grown up supporting it, but I've always known the, the magnitude of the club and the size of it. Some people, including UK Health Secretary Matt Hancock, have urged Premier League footballers to take a pay cut, given the circumstances affecting people throughout society. 
Discussions between clubs and the Professional Footballers Association are ongoing in that regard, while Liverpool were forced to review controversial plans to furlough non-playing members of staff. The Reds are, however, making an impact in their local community, and nowhere is this more evident than in their work with the North Liverpool Food Bank. To find out more about this enterprise, and to see how the Food Bank is handling the current climate of social distancing, I caught up with Labour MP for West Derby, Ian Byrne. So where we are now is regarding the food, over 30% come from the football fans, uh, which is huge elements of, of, of keeping the, the shelves stocked and the, uh, and the ability for food banks to operate. That's been taken away. So what we decided to do a couple of weeks ago was try and set up some sort of fundraising um, uh, and try and do it digitally online. And you know, the response has been absolutely magnificent. So we've just given paid to you. So it must be nearly £100,000 now, which has been raised a lot of that by Liverpool Football Club as well. Some their donations have been magnificent from the players, the staff, Peter Moores. So that's been crucial in giving us the ability to set up what we set up now, which is the uh, food uh, hubs, the, the making of the emergency parcels, which will start this week. You, you mentioned the football club there, and I know that they've, uh, you know, the players in particular and, and the, the, the the foundation in particular are real real supporters of that and have been for, for a number of years. It does come at a, a very good time and Liverpool are, are, are willing to make those kind of donations. Obviously, the, 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 the covering the shortfall from the, the home games that were coming up and then obviously the donation from the players as well. It must be massively appreciated and obviously it sets a good um, a good example for others to follow as well. Yeah, it does, yeah. yeah obviously, you know, the biggest club in the world at the moment and certainly the most, uh, most successful to do what it's done with regards to that. And that sort of uh, thinking and insight into what's happening within the community is something Liverpool have developed quite well over the last uh, four to five years. Since 1990, have they ever had, in your opinion, a team capable or a team that should have won the league? Probably, two, this, probably yeah. 2009 team, possibly 8-9 with Gerard Torres, Alonso, all of them. Perhaps they should have won it. I think they came up against a bit of a kind of freakish United team where they were losing their way a little bit and what was his name? Federico Makeda just came out of nowhere, scored about five or six goals, all important goals, and disappeared at the face of the earth again. I think 2014 was in one sense heartbreaking, but I think 08 09 hurt more and scarred the club more for longer. You think about 13 14, 13 14, I always like the comparison that a writer Andy Thomas made 13 14 was a toddler running down a hill. And if the toddler gets to the bottom of the end of the hill, it's all smiles at the end, but if it falls over, it's going to take everything with it. And I think that that. 13-14 definitely had an element of that and I don't know, you know, no one had more fun than us in 13-14. Manchester City won the league, no one talks about it. They scored over 100 goals, no one talks about it. And I think people were thinking, oh, this could be our year because we were getting those late late winners, weren't we, in places like Fulham and that. And I think everything was looking fantastic, you know, until, until um, the obvious happened, you know. But I think if you look at that period, in a way, it was meant to be because... If we had won the league in 2014, um, we, we wouldn't have Klopp now. Yeah. We would not have Klopp now. Yeah. And I remember halfway through this season, I got everyone to toast at the pub to not win in the league in 2014, almost ex exorcising that ghost, you know, of not winning the league, but thinking now we have got the real deal. Yeah, and Klopp is the real deal. Yeah, the biggest honour I can imagine to be here for me. One of the biggest clubs in the world. What attracted you then to the challenge here at Liverpool? How do people live football in Liverpool or around Liverpool, all Liverpool fans? Tell me about Jürgen Klopp then, what's he done to this football club? Absolutely transformed us, we're the best of the best back on our perch. So I'm a totally normal guy, um, I'm the normal one maybe if you want this. It's the connection he's brought, like just the whole, the whole owner around the club. I just think we're so lucky to have him, just so lucky to have the best manager in the world. I think if you ask any Liverpool player who's pulled on the shirt, who look at Jurgen Klopp would think 100% I'd love to play for him. There's the old Shankly line that, you know, it's not a matter of life and death, it's much more important than that. Klopp inhabits so many of Shankly's values, but he says the opposite. He says it's not that important. Can everyone just relax a little bit, take the backpack of history off? Is there a club in the world that 
puts more on the manager. Oh no, we I mean we break them. Uh, so it's why he's done ever so well uh, so far because he's not been. I think there's been a couple of moments where he's wobbled. But he, the two two against West Brom, he takes them to the crowd, and then the, the absolute backlash he gets in the media immediately afterwards. I think that will have took him by surprise. But he he decided he was plowing his foot. I always remember the home game after we won, and Lovren was like, Are "We go in the crowd." Then and Klopp was like, "Now we'll leave this one." Uh, I can genuinely remember him. We're going because I enjoyed that. I thought that was good. Uh, that's there. But then you know things like everyone forgets the Sunderland walkout. Yeah. Literally, Klopp in that February on 77 minutes, a third of the ground walks out. Did and you think Klopp, that was possible? Uh, that, that, that we manage it. I didn't think we get that many. Klopp and wasn't there, was he? Klopp, uh, Klopp, was, Klopp, Klopp missed Klopp, that game with he, through illness. Yeah, yeah, he missed that game, which I think was convenient. But he was doing all this pre-match stuff. The way he spoke about it was he didn't take a side. By not taking a side, I think he made his, what his yeah. view on it very, very clear because the easiest side to take would be to back his employer. And then you take that point, and I think from there, six weeks later, eight weeks later, it's Dortmund's at home, 4-3. And if you're Klopp, and I think this is the major thing he's done, is behind the scenes, forget us for a minute. If you're Klopp at the end of that summer, you can go to the people who run the club, you can say, Sunderland's at home, doesn't happen again. Dortmund's what we want. We want as many Dortmunds as we can. They, look at what they can do. If we harness them, they can do that. Stop annoying them. Stop doing the red tin with stupid stuff that would have made the club two million quid more in ticket money. Stop making my job harder. Stop making my job harder yeah. because it's hard enough. The first thing he added was obviously a team that the fans could be proud of in terms of intensity and they're not going to give you 100% in every single game. But we have very little quality. And then we add Sadio Mane and then all of a sudden you start getting people on your side because you make good signings, which compare that to Rogers when he sold Suarez and his first man through the door is Ricky Lambert, isn't it? All them things is exactly what you're on about, isn't it? Yeah. What was the final piece of the jigsaw that you thought? He is the final piece of the jigsaw, that is, and it, and it just wasn't. I don't think there's a player in this team that's been the final jigsaw. I think the final piece of the jigsaw has been in here, in the minds, the mentality. He talks about mentality monsters. You look at every time in the Premier League era when Liverpool have finished second, the hangover from it has been so big that normally the manager's gone within about 12 months. Benitez has gone within 12 months. Rodgers has gone, I think it was 15. Klopp has mentioned it so many times. And that's something that he's built from the minute he walked in. But one of the first things that he said was, you want to turn everybody from doubt us to believers but the other thing he said was we want to write our own history. Few could have imagined in 1990 that it'd be 30 years before Liverpool next won a league title and certainly nobody could have predicted that just a few days before they were due to be crowned Premier League champions the whole of football and indeed the whole of society would have ground to a complete halt. I was only seven years old when Liverpool last won the title in 1990. I think given the current state of the world, everybody's health and safety is the most important thing at this moment in time. Pretty much every day since uh, that period, I've thought and imagined what it would be like for Liverpool to win the title. If the teams in the relegation zone get relegated, then we should definitely win the league. Certainly when you see thousands of people losing their lives and friends and loved ones falling ill and people losing their jobs and suffering immense hardship, you know, it does put things into perspective. But by the same token, you know, there's, uh, there's nothing wrong with talking about football and wanting to know when it comes back. Well, I think this step away from things, this realisation of what could actually be taken away from you, yeah. um, it's, it's almost like now a footballer will feel how I felt when I retired. A lot of money's been spent by fans more than anything else and they would like to see things through to a conclusion. I'd never want to hand it to us. We still had games to go, so in my opinion, you know, no, I don't don't want to hand it either. Even though we are throwing two wins away, for me, it would just feel a bit cheap. Anything worth winning is worth fighting for and worth the wait. I've had to wait a lifetime. So, for me, this is just one way of, and another way of prolonging the inevitable. You know, when you think of all the ways that Liverpool cannot win a league, you would not think <laughs> that this would be one of them. And the thing is, I've got friends who support Arsenal, who support Man United, who support Chelsea, this, whatever, and the banter's gone. I'm having to get to know my Arsenal mates. And I just hope to God that we manage to somehow get this league over the line because I think we absolutely deserve it. I think they'll, they'll get that little bit of realisation once they, once they go back into it to, underst to understand what they've missed. I don't mind if we don't win the league this year because we could also always do it next year undefeated because we have got a fantastic squad, fantastic fans and the best songs around. I mean, people have been waiting 30 years, but I've only been waiting 10 myself, but it's still a long time to wait. What the future holds remains unclear. 
football, understandably, is taking a back seat with the health and safety of millions of people across the world taking precedence. Liverpool may or may not get their hands on that elusive Premier League trophy, but one thing's for sure, for the time being, all they can do is wait.